The Viscount was in a tough situation during a battle. His shield couldn't protect him from an attack, and he was injured. He wanted to heal himself using a spell, but then Michael, his opponent, intervened. Michael punched the Viscount in the face and used his magical powers on him once more. The Viscount tried to give up and surrender, but before he could say anything, Michael prevented him from speaking. Michael had a list of things he wanted to accomplish before his possible demise. This list was like a bucket list, and one of the items on it was to defeat the Viscount thoroughly. As a result, Michael kept relentlessly striking the Viscount, much like a punching bag. At this point, Michael's father stepped into the scene and urged Michael to stop the fight, explaining that the battle was over and Michael had emerged as the victor. However, Michael, still seething with anger, protested that the Viscount hadn't officially surrendered. In response, Michael's father pointed out that the Viscount had signified his defeat by literally biting his own lips. Upon witnessing the Viscount making some movements with his hands, Michael insisted that his father take notice because it implied that the Viscount had not completely given up, and this meant Michael could continue to attack him. However, Michael's father cautioned him to stop before resorting to violence and asked the Viscount if he admitted defeat. The Viscount signaled his surrender by nodding his head. Michael's father then employed teleportation magic to send the Viscount to his room, thereby concluding the conflict. Afterward, Michael's father acknowledged the significant improvement in Michael's skills since their last encounter. He even went on to say that the skills Michael displayed were reminiscent of those of a mage from a distant past, known as the Twilight Mage. Michael, however, downplayed these observations, suggesting that it was merely coincidental. In response, Michael's father queried whether he might be underestimating his son's abilities. He inquired if Michael was trying to convey that he was inherently exceptionally talented. Michael responded by simply asserting that he was his father's son, not saying much more on the matter. Michael's father then expressed his trust in Michael and sought to understand if showing his remarkable skills was what Michael had intended to demonstrate to his father. This led to an exchange where Michael inquired about the purpose of his father's questions. In response, his father highlighted that while the Viscount was his friend, he might not be the ideal teacher. This raised questions about whether Michael had ever considered being taught by the Viscount and why he had chosen to show this battle to his father. Michael believed that his father's questions made sense. He explained that he wouldn't have selected the Viscount as his teacher. He further clarified that his actions weren't motivated by emotion, especially since his father had no intention of removing the Viscount from his role as a trusted advisor. It was clear to Michael that he was the only one who viewed his father as an equal, a perspective stemming from the loneliness that often accompanied being the head of a family. He didn't like the idea of keeping danger nearby, even though he knew his father wasn't that type of person. In response, Michael's father concluded that this was the reason for Michael's actions. To this, Michael replied affirmatively, stating his commitment to taking on the responsibility of managing the Viscount from that point onward. His goal was to ensure that the tower his father had built would not fall in the future. Meanwhile, in the Viscount's room, he found it hard to come to terms with the fact that he had been defeated by a young mage who had only reached the fourth level of power. To make matters worse, the Marcus himself had witnessed the outcome, making it impossible for the Viscount to alter the result of the battle. He was in a state of confusion, unsure of what he should do, and he began to contemplate the consequences of his actions. At that moment, Michael unexpectedly entered the Viscount's room. The Viscount was surprised to see him and wondered why he was there. Michael reminded the Viscount of the conditions of their battle, specifically the agreement that they would form a master and student relationship. This perplexed the Viscount. He found it peculiar that Michael appeared to know he would win the battle. He also questioned why the price of their duel was to become master and student. These circumstances led the Viscount to ponder whether Michael had a more intricate plan in mind, one that extended beyond mere humiliation. He speculated that Michael might be testing him and that the situation wasn't entirely resolved. Michael proceeded to clarify that what he desired was the future of the family. The Viscount acknowledged this and recognized that Michael had been somewhat passive for a while. He further acknowledged the need to take action and not remain stagnant, especially after the recent developments. Observing the determination in Michael's expression, the Viscount came to the realization that Michael was correct in his assessment. He offered his support to Michael's cause, expressing his willingness to assist in any way that Michael saw fit. In response, Michael responded with a smirk and asserted his authority over the Viscount.
he reminded the Viscount that he was now his student and instructed him to cease speaking and address him as master. Viscount found himself in an unexpected and challenging situation. He was taken aback when Michael, his recent adversary, told him that he had to become his student. Michael, with a serious and unwavering expression, affirmed the sincerity of his request. The Viscount, noticing Michael's determination, realized that this bet was no mere jest or casual wager. It was a serious commitment that he had to address. Feeling the weight of this decision, the Viscount considered his options. He understood that he needed to mitigate the potential consequences of this bet, no matter the cost. To that end, he began to express his concerns to Michael. The Viscount reminded Michael of his own status as a Seventh Circle Mage, someone who had supported the Marcus and held a significant position. He felt that becoming Michael's student was not a suitable role for someone of his stature. Michael, however, urged the Viscount to abandon such thoughts and not trivialize the significance of a mage's promise. He emphasized that a mage's promise was a binding commitment where the stakes were high. Breaking such a promise had severe repercussions, including the potential loss of magical circles and abilities. The Viscount, growing increasingly frustrated, pointed out that he possessed more magical circles and was older than Michael. He questioned the idea of someone with his experience and capabilities becoming a student. Michael firmly asserted that this transformation was already underway. He made it clear that the Viscount's new role as a student was non-negotiable. Following their discussion, they proceeded to the arena. It was here that the Viscount publicly acknowledged Michael as his master. The Viscount recognized that, in his new role as a student, he needed to show commitment and adherence to this agreement. Deep inside, the Viscount was conflicted. He knew that he had to resist any urges to abandon his duties as Michael's escort. He understood that failing in this new role could result in the abandonment of his magical circles. Michael, now the Viscount's teacher, took on the responsibility of imparting knowledge. He felt it wasn't satisfying to crush the Viscount immediately, remembering his own experiences before he had transcended. There was more that he wanted to achieve. The Viscount, however, initially resisted the idea of learning from his new master. Michael saw the instability in the Viscount's magical circles, which hindered his ability to use magic effectively. He believed that with a little pressure, the Viscount's emotional pain would prove that his circles were unstable. He caused the Viscount to experience physical pain, which left him writhing on the ground. Michael realized that, to truly understand magic and develop one's circles, one needed a proper link to the circles. He explained that it was possible to create circles without transcendence, a state called an apostle. With the Viscount's circles broken, Michael offered to teach him how to calm and restore them. The Viscount was astonished to learn that Michael knew about his circles. He wondered if the Marcus had revealed this information to Michael, and he began to suspect that the entire battle had been orchestrated by the Marcus. Michael dismissed these speculations and encouraged the Viscount to stop making unfounded claims. He pointed out that the unusual aspects of the Viscount's magic during the battle had been a clear indication that something was amiss. Additionally, the Viscount's physical symptoms, such as grasping his heart, were typical of mages with unstable circles. Michael made a grim prediction, stating that the Viscount would not survive in his current condition. He explained that the only way to save the Viscount was to remove the ring mana that was causing the instability. Michael offered a solution. He would absorb the ring mana from the Viscount. This would result in the Viscount losing five circles, but would ultimately benefit both of them. The Viscount was shocked at the prospect of losing his hard-earned circles. He had worked tirelessly to attain them, and the idea of parting with them was disheartening. However, Michael argued that the Viscount's circles were causing more harm than good. Before his transcendence, the Viscount had been slowly deteriorating, and his circles had tempted him toward a dark path. Michael emphasized that the Viscount's circles served no practical purpose as they were merely for show. The Viscount had stacked his circles together to appease the Marcus, a futile effort that served no real purpose. Even the Marcus was aware of the Viscount's predicament, although he had chosen to overlook it. The Viscount, realizing the futility of his previous actions, finally accepted Michael's offer. He agreed to let Michael absorb his mana and remove the problematic ring mana. Michael had successfully absorbed the Viscount's mana, and as a result, he had reached the fifth circle in his magical abilities. For him, reaching the fifth circle seemed rather easy. On the other hand, the Viscount felt despondent after losing his magical circles, yet in Michael's eyes, absorbing the Viscount's mana had been an urgent task, and it was only the beginning of their efforts. As he reflected on the immediate events, 
Mikal was fully aware that the challenges ahead were far more daunting. He contemplated the prophecy from Cassandra, foreseeing the resurrection of the demon god in seven years. Ignoring such a prophecy would have great consequences, as the world would remain ill-prepared to face the formidable threat posed by the demon god. Mikal acknowledged that the demon god's power, even in its incomplete form, was overwhelming. There was no force capable of resisting it when it was not at full strength. The realization came too late for the Empire, as the seventh-ranked knight, Steel Kelvin, had been crushed by the demon god. A catastrophic disaster loomed, and efforts to gather heroes and allies had proven futile. Half of the Empire had been annihilated, leaving no time for a coordinated response. In a desperate attempt to combat the demon god's resurgence, the temple summoned warriors, forming a demon god subjugation squad called Argo. Maiko was part of this squad. It was a time when Cassandra the Oracle became the most crucial individual. Despite her young age, she had foreseen the impending disaster and had shared her prophecies, often at great personal cost. Cassandra's prophecies were real, and she had tirelessly warned people, even while suffering from physical distress. Regrettably, no one had heeded her warnings. During Michael's pre-transcendent days, Cassandra's prophecy held no significance as no one believed her. Michael reflected on the futility of unheeded prophecies. A prophecy that went ignored was essentially pointless. He acknowledged that the fate of Cassandra remained unknown after her warnings had gone unanswered. Michael assumed that she had not met a favorable end, unless she too had undergone transcendence, although he considered it unlikely. Michael's thoughts turned to his own plans. He resolved to sign up for the warrior selection, but this raised a significant question. How would he locate Cassandra, who had left the temple after her prophecies were dismissed? He needed to find a way to contact her urgently, but he was unsure how to proceed. At that moment, Michael's butler entered the room, announcing a guest who had business with him. The guest turned out to be Leon Parslope, a figure of significance in their world. Michael joined Leon in the room, where the latter inquired about the training method that Michael had mentioned earlier. Michael, somewhat surprised by Leon's early arrival, presumed that Leon was busy with his own engagement. However, Leon clarified that the training method was more important to him than the engagement. He revealed that he had never been enthusiastic about the engagement in the first place and urged Michael to expedite the training process. Michael introduced an unexpected condition to their agreement, much to Leon's annoyance. Leon questioned this new stipulation, expressing his displeasure with the unexpected change. Nevertheless, Michael assured Leon that the new condition would not be detrimental to him. Leon insisted that Michael reveal this additional condition. Michael explained that it pertained to a matter of possession, specifically concerning a dungeon. Leon was taken aback and claimed to have no knowledge of such a matter. However, Michael's keen perception led him to believe that Leon was not telling the truth. He could see the uncertainty in Leon's eyes. Michael accused Leon of being a poor liar, further pressing him about the dungeon's details. He unveiled that Leon's father, Count Parslope, had discovered the dungeon a year ago. Mana had been found in the dungeon, and Count Parslope had declared it a mana stone mine. However, most of the investigation teams that had been sent into the dungeon had gone missing. The financial strain from these expeditions was the reason behind their need for the engagement with the Lindel Princess. Leon was astounded that Michael had knowledge of the situation, suspecting the existence of a spy within their family. However, Michael clarified that he had gathered this information from rumors circulating among warriors, making it an educated guess rather than a result of espionage. Curious about the dungeon, Michael expressed his interest in learning more. Leon had a question for his friend Michael. He wanted to know what exactly was going on. Most of their investigation team hadn't returned, and they had dubbed the place they had ventured into as a dungeon. Though it might as well have been a living nightmare, the team couldn't simply launch a raid into this place. Michael had his own thoughts about the situation. He believed that the Parslope family had clung to this dungeon until the very end, and now someone else had unveiled its secrets and claimed all the rewards. Michael offered to help Leon by taking on the dungeon himself, in place of the investigation team. This left Leon puzzled. He wondered if Michael thought he could succeed where experienced mercenaries had failed. Michael, however, was brimming with confidence. He assured Leon that dungeon exploration was a fundamental task for mages, which seemed to irritate Leon. He couldn't help but wonder why Michael was so self-assured. Michael reassured Leon that his actions wouldn't bring harm to Leon's family. In fact, they might even benefit from his efforts to uncover the dungeon's secrets, even if he were to fail. 
Grateful for Michael's offer, Leon contemplated the training that lay ahead. Michael promised to teach him after they had successfully navigated the dangers of the dungeon. Leon was thrilled at the prospect of learning and agreed to the plan. He did, however, mention that the final decision rested with his father. Afterward, Michael approached his own father to discuss the situation. His father was taken aback by the news and couldn't believe what he was hearing. He reminded Michael of his commitment to look after the Lindell family, so he was confused by this sudden change of plans. Michael tried to explain that this new venture wasn't entirely unrelated to his previous promise. He mentioned hearing that the Parslope family had become the new engagement partner for the Lindells. His father wondered if Michael was planning to cause a ruckus there. Michael reassured his father that he had no such intentions. He also emphasized his promise to Leon Parslope, underscoring the importance of a mage's word. However, a lighthearted argument about whether a particular object was a bat or a staff ensued. Michael tried to steer the conversation away from the argument and hinted at another reason behind his decision. However, he refused to share the details. His father grew more agitated but inquired if he could trust Michael. In response, Michael grinned and affirmed that his father had always been able to trust him. However, as Michael reflected, he couldn't help but be troubled by his father's trust in him, especially considering his past regrets and the times he had tried to escape his role as a fool since his father's passing. These thoughts were a reminder of why Michael had given up on pursuing a career as a warrior. His father wanted to know if Michael had the confidence to handle the matters concerning the Lindell family. Michael acknowledged the connection but didn't reveal any more details about his plans. His father ultimately relented and told him to do as he saw fit. Suddenly, Michael sensed an external presence, prompting him to ask his father if he had a guest. His father, however, couldn't see anything unusual. Michael, feeling a bit embarrassed, attributed it to his own mistake and left the room. Unbeknownst to him, the anonymous person present in the room was the butler, who then engaged in conversation with Michael's father. The butler noted the significant changes in Michael's character, highlighting how he had become bolder and his magic had grown exceptionally strong without any involvement of witchcraft. He emphasized that this was undoubtedly Michael's own talent, and perhaps he had realized it a bit later than others. The butler explained that this development wasn't uncommon for those with the blood of Walpurgis, given the history of their ancestors and their connection to the Walpurgis family spirit. This awakened potential was not unusual, Mike Hale's father decided that the butler should accompany Mike Hale to the Parslope territory as agreed in their contract. Later, as Mike Hale and Leon prepared to depart, the butler, despite his own health issues, joined them. He explained that this was at the request of Mike Hale's father, who was concerned about the potential trouble Mike Hale might encounter. Mike Hale couldn't help but wonder about the butler's true intentions and whether there was more to him than met the eye. The butler joined them, and they began their journey to the Parslope territory.